Well, welcome to um, another edition of Hardfire TV on Brooklyn Free Speech Media. Today we're going to be talking about books that are important to the Libertarian Meeting. I'm Gary Popkin, your host, and today we have with us Cameron Weber. Hello, Hello Gary. Hello, Thank Cameron. you. Thank you, Gary. Um, he's going to discuss two books that are of importance to him. Uh, Cameron is an historian and an economist. He's an ex-diplomat and previous chief of financial oversight and coordination at the U.S. State Department. That's right. Well, it's uh, it's very good to uh, have you with us, uh, Cameron. Thank you, Gary. Now, um, what books are we going to be talking okay. about today? And yeah, yeah. why are they important? Why are they important? Why are they sure. important? Well, the books we're going to talk about today, Gary, um, uh, a while back we did a show on the Great Depression, looking at the, the macroeconomics of the Great Depression, looking at the uh, interventions done by the New, by the new Dealers, uh, and, and then including the mass unionization, and then how uh, the high wage doctrine and the regime uncertainty created by the New Dealers constantly changing the rule of law. Uh, prolonged a recession into the Great Depression while the rest of the world was recovering from the uh, uh, financial market crashes of 1929. Uh, the New Deal took over and prolonged the Great Recession into the, uh, into recession into the Great Depression. And the, the books we're going to look at today tell a little bit different story during the same period of time, the uh, 1930s era. And uh, these books are um, popular history, or cultural history, or working class history. They're different than the economic history we talked about before. Uh, the main one we'll be talking about is this, uh, Elizabeth Cohen's Making of a New Deal. Uh, when I studied this at the New School under Oz Frankel uh, in our historiography class, um, <clears throat> Uh, this was in its 19th printing. So this is a very popular, uh, well-respected uh, book by a, a, Harvard, a Harvard historian, uh, Elizabeth Cohen, uh, Making of a New Deal. And uh, it's uh, industrial workers in Chicago. So we're looking at, uh, Elizabeth Cohen looks particular at Chicago uh, in her case study of how the New Deal affected people. So we're looking at how the New Deal affected people. And, and then how would that help to in, inculcate in people a larger federal federal mm -hmm. role for yes. the for the state yes. in that, people's lives yes, which we culturally uh, still uh, living with today. sure more and more still yeah, still yeah suffering yeah. with today yeah mm -hmm. yeah so culturally and socially how that occurred to the working class or or to the common man or whatever we, Devlin mm -hmm. called the, mm -hmm. the called the, those who aren't the elites called them the common man yeah. So, so anyway, uh, so and then the other one we're looking at is From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State by David Bieto. And uh, this one um, talks about prior to the New Deal and the buildup of the welfare state, how you had decentralized uh, local, ethnic, and religious groups who provided for each other. These are called lodges or fraternal organizations, and about how uh, they, they did uh, we, we would call it social in insurance, we call it insurance, but it was done mutually, decentrally, uh, and through uh, mutual aid, mutual cooperation. So between these two books, we'll be telling a, a social history of the New Deal. Right? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, those are the two okay. books. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. No, and like I said, it, it complements our previous show on the Great Depression. And uh, we're going to have time to talk about only one of the books. We'll, we'll, do, we'll focus on, Co on Cohen's book, um, and we only have 30-minute show, so you can't do justice to Elizabeth Cohen's book in, in 30 minutes, so we'll cover what I think is important, <laughs> right? And uh, in, in context, we, we need to look at Roosevelt's Electoral Coalition. So his electoral coalition was uh, Tammany Hall in New York, right? And what was Tammany yes. Hall exactly, Gary? You're a native New Yorker. Uh, oh, uh, Tammany 
Hall uh, machine or whatever it is. Um, I, I'm too young. Yeah. I, I don't know who the mayor was. Yeah, uh, but, but Roosevelt was the governor, Tammany right? Um, Ro Ro Roosevelt had been governor of New York yeah, State. In, yeah. yeah, in New York State. So it's the New York political machine was one tr part of his troika. His, uh, real, his electoral troika was the Tammany Hall or New York political machine. The other uh, tro third of the troika was uh, conservative Southerners. Conservative Southerners, meaning racist yes. Southerners, um, who Roosevelt promised not to promised to veto any uh, federal anti-lynching law. Here is Mr. Federal, Mr. Uh, Centralization himself, and yet he promised to veto an anti-lynching law in, in order to ensure the uh, Southern vote, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if you go, if you go to Richmond, uh, Virginia, or to New Orleans, Louisiana, you'll see very few sidewalks there. <laughs> and the reason there's very few sidewalks there, even though the, the, the New Deal uh, Federal Works Project, uh, Works Progress Administration, built tens of thousands of miles of sidewalks they didn't have to build any in the south because they already had the the vote <laughs> in the south mm -hmm. right right and the then racist the, the, the racist mm -hmm. democrat southern mm -hmm. vote yeah yeah uh and then um the third part of the troika which cohen's book covers is the uh labor unions in the north so uh her book focuses specifically on the labor unions in the north in chicago and that's what we'll be talking about today Mm -hmm. is the is the immigrant labor uh, in Chicago who then uh, turned Chicago into a, a one-party town and like we said before when we rehearsed this show that it's been a one-party town now for 86 years 85 years the Democrats Democrat. have been in Democrats charge of Chicago crime Chicago. rates very high mm -hmm. in Chicago yeah. Yeah. okay Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so what, um, what Cohen does, she describes how Chicago was an ethnic-based society in the 1910s and 1920s uh, with mutual aid. Uh, different immigrant groups would live in different places. And uh, if you could sh show uh, the photograph. Yes, give me, give me um, right the photo. Right here. Right here. Yeah, yeah. We're very well organized on hard fire. The, uh, my, uh, okay. our, our technical director who couldn't make it today, she told me I've spent more time on this show than any other show. Uh, right, so if you could show, this is from Cohen, page 11. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1919, Chicago industrial workers lived in neighborhoods determined by their jobs and ethnicity. Here is a worker at U.S. Steel's South Works plant in South Chicago, is surrounded by two uh, most important symbols of his community, the steel mill and St. Michael's Polish Catholic Church. Fragmentations of workers' rank by ethnicity, race, and geography impeded efforts to organize unions in the city's factories just after World War I. So um, the story we're also telling it is how, y so you had this uh, uh, fragmentation uh, or decentralization of society, so unionization, mass unionization was not possible, but by the end of the New Deal, as part of uh, Roosevelt's uh, electoral coalition, uh, he passed the Wagner, the National Recovery Act, and the Wagner Act, which uh, removed uh, uh, labor union um, harm from the civil courts to the administrative courts. So uh, the labor unions were exempt from. Uh, had a special treatment under law, so labor unionization tripled during the New Deal. And that's part of the story we're telling, is how, is how the New Deal allowed this uh, mass uh, unionization uh, to took, occur. It uh, took disputes against labor unions out uh, of the civil so, right, courts right. and into uh, the National Labels, Roosevelt's own courts. It's exactly, where they've been ever since, mm -hmm. and under the National mm -hmm. Labor Relations mm -hmm. Board between the Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see what else we have. Um, so then World War I introduces uh, the masses to finance uh, under the war bonds. There was four major war bond issues. So now uh, the masses, or everyone, are accustomed to finance. And uh, as part of this finance they're accustomed to is uh, included the, these mutual aid organizations, these fraternal organizations where you would pay in 
uh, voluntarily, cooperatively, and then if something happened, uh, you, you get uh, uh, laid off at work, or you, you, or you get married, or you need to borrow money, or for whatever reason you die, a lot of it's for, uh, for uh, burial services. Um, the, the, this was self-financed locally and decentrally, right? And uh, and then as as prosperity increased during the Roaring 1920s, uh, labor agitation increased. Uh, as well, more wealth was created, people started to then have more uh, power and self-respect, and uh, so they started to agitate for more uh, labor rights in the 1920s. And then so the, the, the corporations started to provide their own uh, social safety nets to their workers in order to prevent this mass unionization. And this, this, this social safety net pr provided by employers uh, included life insurance, uh, health care, pension plans, paid vacations, and most importantly, employee stock ownership plans. In other words, starting to share the profits with sure. the, um, mm -hmm. breaking the class struggle by, by sharing profits, right? So that's mm -hmm. how you break uh, Karl Marx's class struggle by incentive compatibility, uh, including the, the sharing of profits. And so, uh, so you, have, you have both the mutual aid organizations and then also the rise of uh, this uh, social welfare uh, provided by corporations. And this, this uh, what Cohen and other um, uh, working class historians, they call this worker capitalism. So worker capitalism is when the workers' employers are providing their social safety net. Yeah? And then, and then as the depression uh, w worsens in the 1930s, the employers can no longer afford to, 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 to keep up these social safety nets, uh, and it, which, is, which is very convenient for the Roosevelt administration, who at the same time was agitation, agitating for the centralization of these things, the minimum wage, national minimum wage law, uh, national Social Security, um, things like that. A and it, uh, the uh, AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, was a big Roosevelt program. And the idea behind that was, as Roosevelt's building up the welfare warfare state, uh, to keep women at home caring for their children, boys, so that they can become citizen soldiers. And this is all part of the uh, social science research of the 1930s that we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Cohen, Cohen doesn't. And it's in the Cohen book. Cohen doesn't get into the citizen soldiers as much, but other. Uh, if you go to my website, CameronEconomics.com, you can see my dissertation, which includes Cohen, Bieto, and then uh, these other things like the uh, AFDC program and the citizen soldiers. Yeah, yeah. Behind that, militarization, which of course is th with us through today as well. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's look at uh, the photo on page 239 of Elizabeth Cohen's book. Right. So uh, this is from page 239 of Elizabeth Cohen's book. Um, In giving away sausages to hungry people, many of whom were probably present or former employees, meatpacker Oscar Meyer, third from the right, was a typical welfare capitalist in the early Depression. Although welfare capitalists were ideologically committed to having business, not government, solve the problems of the Depression, they abandoned many of their welfare programs when they decided the cost was too great. So they're just not making the profits because, uh, because of the Depression, the, the continued Depression, and then the, uh, ha the need to pay high wages. Now, you call these... Um Welfare capitalism. Yeah, right? yeah. And welfare. Previously, you referred to worker capitalism, and can oh, you oh, that she. For our, oh, um, so in fact, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cohen is not consistent in her terminology. She's calling oh. them. Uh, uh, what is she calling them? Welfare capitalists, and she also calls them worker capitalists. Oh, oh she okay. calls them both. No, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. very no, good. No distinction. Good point, okay, Gary. Wonderful. Good okay. point. Good. Okay. Thank you for catching well, thank that. You. Well, thank you for fixing that up. Yeah, I did relook at the script as you asked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so so uh, so prior to this, bi the buildup of the AFDC, the minimum wage, the Social Security, the public works, uh, by by the end of the Great Depression, 25% of all American families had received their income from the, uh, 
the works program works progress administration so the the, the 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 fact that the government would serve as employer of last resort was also kind of inculcated into the the, the, the fabric of the of, of the United States the, the big presence of the United States government into people's lives and prior to that the only visible sign of the federal government to people's lives was the post office, post office yeah. and, and federal judges when they would go around and make their rounds. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So in fact, uh, the progressives, this was the progressive era we're talking about, the progressives wanted this rule of experts rather than allow voluntary mutual aid. This is the beginning of the elitist utilitarian society we have today. And I'd like to, to read from uh, Bieto on this one the mutual aid to the welfare state, Bieto, on uh, the elites taking over the planning of people's lives as opposed to the voluntary and decentralized mutual aid that Bieto so well documents. So he, he, he calls this subchapter, uh, social workers must make a noise. Fraternalists were eager, eager to make the American Association for Labor Legislation into a whipping boy. They repeatedly reminded their audiences that despite its name, the AALL was not a labor union. To the contrary, the Fraternal Monitor warned that the AALL was prim primarily an organization of social reformers and college professors. Support of compulsory insurance by professional social workers was not only paternalistic, but demonstrated their need to make a noise in order to earn their salaries. The Monitor clearly did not share the fascination with, progressive, with professional expertise that was so prevalent during the Progressive Era. In what kind, if I may interrupt, what kind of insurance are you referring to? Oh, the, the fact that the, the experts in the federal government know better than the mutual aid uh, mm -hmm. decentrally. Okay. So mm -hmm. the, uh, in order for these social activists, social workers, progressive elites, they have to be vocal in order to, uh, to justify their salaries, is what, okay. is what, oh, okay. is what okay. David okay. Bieto was saying, more or less. Social workers must make a noise, is the sub mm -hmm. subchapter. So mm -hmm. they're making the noise. And then this is a quote from the, uh, the monitor. Theorists in the classroom have produced few measures of practical progress. The application of their doctrines usually has led to oppression and bloodshed. The editorial concluded that the academics and reformers in the ALLL subscribed to the elitist notion that people of superior intelligence should do something for the lower class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have today, where you have the bureaucrats in uh, the FDA, how, how many can we name? Yes, the FDA, the SEC, the what, HHS, the uh, what, FDA. Um, Thomas Sowell called the vision of the anointed. Yeah, so this is the anointed are now mm -hmm. taking over, mm -hmm. yes, according to Bieto and, and uh, Liz Elizabeth Cohen. Uh, I wasn't there, but they've documented it with a lot of historical uh, archival research. Uh, so one of the leading federal government programs was the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which bailed out bankrupt bankrupt mortgages, just like we have today, the, the housing bubble. Mm -hmm, yes. uh, mm -hmm. So the, the federal government uh, has been in the housing industry ever since the 1930s, deeply embedded in the housing industry to try to encourage people to build up debt so they don't question the elite ruling class. Just It started with uh, housing, and w as we saw that recently with the huge uh, housing boom and bust. Uh, a lot of that was due, was due to the Federal Home Administration requiring that half of the houses be 0% uh, down mortgage, 0% uh, down uh, mortgages. Um, and so now in addition to the housing uh, finance and debt, we have consumer debt and now student debt. So the, the federal state has purposely created debt, mm -hmm. right, for the, well, uh, b banking is, a, is an oligopoly. The central banking yeah. is oligopoly. Mm -hmm. The banking sector is an oligopoly, and it's a revolving door oligopoly, right? Because there's no free entry and exit in the banking industry. It's very difficult yep. to yes, open up alternative open banks. Yes. Right. And, and Bitcoin was declared a, uh, alt currencies are declared an asset, so you have to pay capital gains on them, so there's no competition against the fiat money, right? So all of this debt st stuff started in the 1930s as well. Let's look at, um, I'm going to read from, from Cohen, uh, page 274, about this uh, debt. 
Um, Chicago factory workers who had sacrificed so much during the 1920s to buy their homes were very grateful during the 1920s when you had easy money, right? E money, mm -hmm. uh, uh, below mm -hmm. market money, mm -hmm. just like you had during the housing bubble of, of, uh, oh, leading up yeah. to the recent crash. Mm -hmm. Chicago factories workers who had sacrificed so much during the 1920s to buy their homes were very grateful to the federal government for, pre for protecting them from foreclosure. The reaction when they were turned down for HOLC loans, moreover, reveals how quickly they came to expect this government intervention as a right do them, much like relief. <coughs> I should mention that prior to, uh, during this mutual aid period, uh, prior to the, the New Deal, as Beato says, it was shameful and disrespectful to accept charity or, or yes, government, right. government right. assistance. Uh, here's, here's a quote that uh, Cohen gets from the archives. My children served in the recent World's War. <laughs> little did they know there was another one coming. To make our United States a safe place to live and protect our homes, complained Anna Cohen, a widow whose property was refused an HOLC loan because it included a store she rented out. Uh, Flory Calzaretta, disqualified on some other technical grounds, made a similar defense to President Roosevelt. So now people are writing President Roosevelt directly. <laughs> <laughs> President, dear President Roosevelt, I am an American citizen for the past 30 years and my children were born in America and as such I believe I am entitled to some consideration. Mm -hmm. your, excellence, your Excellency made these loans possible for destitute cases like mine. And then Barbara Ann Carter blamed foreigners for depriving sure. her of her share. Mm -hmm. Blame the oh, foreigners. Right. Even though this is all about immigrants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Barbara Ann Carter blamed foreigners for depriving her of a fair government share. When we first applied and tried to get this loan over two years ago, we found, by, we found by sitting there hours and hours that no one was getting any attention of loans but foreigners on the south side. No sooner had the federal government entered the mortgage business than Chicagoans counted on it being there. Mm -hmm. yes. right. Okay, now we have um, about five minutes. Uh, well, a little more than four uh, minutes. A little more than four minutes. Yeah, a little more than four minutes. Let, let's yeah, show up. Uh, yeah, let's show a pa uh, photo from page two seventy five. Uh, many Chicago voters, like those depicted here, rallying for President Ro Roosevelt's reelection in nineteen thirty six, felt indebted to him because he helped us save our homes. The federal government's homeowners loan corporation protected many workers homes from foreclosure by offering long-term low interest mortgages. So you're encouraging debt creation by keeping the interest rates low. FDR and Uncle Sam were assuming a responsibility that previously had belonged to ethnic banks and building and loan associations. Uh, so page 283. You do my best. So this is called the meaning of worker statism from Cohen, page 283. Chicago workers felt they were making a new deal during the 1930s when they became invested in national party politics and a national welfare state. It is important to consider, however, just how new that deal was and exactly what it meant that they made it. Workers' faith in the new state grew out of old as well as new expectations. On the one hand, they wanted the government to take care of them in much the same paternalistic way as they had previously hoped their welfare capitalist employers and their ethnic communities would do. This dependence on a paternalistic state is most clearly seen in the way workers viewed Rose President Roosevelt. For many workers, FDR was the federal government. In the election of 1932, people voted against Herbert Hoover. By 1936, they were voting for Roosevelt on the grounds that he gave me a job or he saved my home. One unhappy, okay, FDR is the head of the household since he gives me the money. As evident in the, uh, see, as evident in the testimony presented in this chapter, distraught Chicagoans frustrated by the relief bureaucracy often appealed to Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt for help. In enough instances to keep them asking, their appeals to Father and Mother Roosevelt, in quotes mm -hmm. from the archives, were rewarded with action. The files of New Deal agencies abound with letters, many on tattered piece, peepers, pieces of paper in barely literate English appealing to President Roosevelt for assistance. People found it easy to look to him, moreover, because he went out of his way to cultivate an image as a fatherly 
figure con concerned for the needy point. So, so this is the beginning of the imperialist presidency. So, Gary, do you think the we, we imperial presidency? Yeah, the imperial, yeah, yeah the imperialist nation yes. and the imperial yes, presidency. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Congress is uh, is interested in giving its right. authority and responsibility to the executive branch. So mm -hmm. The laws these days are just full of uh, the secretary of such and such department shall sure. promulgate the rules and regulations. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? For the bureaucrats. The, the, the the churn, James Buchanan called that the churning state, where the, 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 you turn over so much to the administration for all the regulations that it just gives the technocrats and the administration a lot of power, the churning state. And also, uh, President Obama had more consecutive wars going on than any other president. And were any of those wars declared by Congress? Oh, no, not, 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 a, not a war. I don't, uh, I don't remember the last war that was declared by Congress. Was that <laughs> there's police war actions or, or uh, I don't know, um, so many things. Well, yeah, I, I, guess that's, I guess that's good enough. You may want to um, uh, say that we have a, a minute or so left. Yeah. And so if you have any closing comments, well, make them now. Enjoyed learning about the social aspects in our history of the soft despotism we have today, unlike the hard despotism of the divine right to rule prior to the Enlightenment. Uh, de Tocqueville warned that the United States would, would turn into a soft, despo soft despotism if we didn't have our uh, cooperative uh, civil society, and, and he was correct. Uh, as warned about by Jefferson and to Tocqueville. Thank, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time on uh, Hardfire TV.